The rose can be red, the violet can be blue. Honey can be sweet, and so too could you. The only rose I ever knew was dark-skinned, brown and beautiful like a fire opal. She wore her black curls straight as a sheet and hung around her shoulders and gleamed like water every time she moved. She despised the color red and lived in yellows and blues. The only violet I ever knew was Mother to Rose and she was never blue. She didn't have time for sadness to wrap its thick fingers around her heart, the organ already burdened heavy with responsibility, duty, and expectation. There was no time for blue in a world so colored, she would say with a laugh that stretched too tight, hitting the air like the snap of a rubber band. Often, I felt that she was colorblind, calling her blues reds, mistaking her sapphires for pyrite. And honey, I find, is only sweet when you source it yourself, the sting of the bee always less painful than the price of kindness. Every sweet thing life ever offered me lay bitter and heavy on my tongue, the flavor and weight of it impressed upon my person for years at a time. And you, honey, were no exception. I wrote this over a year ago. The notes on my phone say it was on September 4th at 11 p.m. It must have been in that weird in-between state before sleep finally takes hold, but consciousness is still putting up a good fight. Roses are red randomly skittered across my psyche, and I was struck by how firm the poem is in its language. Something cliche that I had heard my whole life, but it isn't strictly true. Roses are not always red. They come in a lot of different colors. Violets might be in other colors too, I'm not sure. I'm not really a flower person, and I didn't take the time to Google it at 11 p.m. Regardless, the thought crossed my mind that a rose or a violet could be anything. And so I wrote this. It's a little dramatic, yes, but when I'm tired, I either get very serious or very weird. So I'm grateful this didn't end up being about cars or something. When I came across it again and decided to put it to video, I wondered if this simple poem was part of something longer I hadn't heard before. Though the original rhyme seems to have been penned in 1590 by Edmund Spencer in his epic The Fairy Queen, the rhyme I'm most used to is the 1784 version, published in a collection of nursery rhymes by Joseph Johnson. It goes like this. The rose is red, the violet is blue. The honey is sweet, and so are you. Thou art my love, and I am thine. I drew thee to my valentine. The lot was cast, and then I drew, and fortune said it should be you. The first part of this poem is familiar, but I don't think I've ever heard any of the rest of it. I'll be honest, the final couplet is more interesting to me. Like, the lot was cast and I drew you. Like, I had to love someone and the universe decided it would be you. Yeah, in reading this, I'm fully ignoring the middle bit for now, but the end kind of makes the beginning sort of, I don't know, sad? Like, roses are red because that's the way it is. Violets are blue because that's the way it is. You are my love because fortune says so. It gives me a bit of the ick, to be honest. I'm not a fan of things that are quote-unquote inevitable. I like it as a trope in certain literature or media, but only if it can be overcome either partially or fully. I hate the thought of not being able to do anything but lay down and let fate have its way. It makes me feel trapped, even if it's only pretend. But actually, looking into the full poem made me think of something else I'd been seeing a lot online lately. Old adages that are being changed for whatever reason. It's not really new, though. Like, I've seen it pop up a bunch over the last few years. The adages that have been granted extensions to change their meanings. You know, like, curiosity killed the cat is what I grew up hearing. But recently, there's been an extension to the saying. Curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back. Or, blood is thicker than water, has been altered to say, the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. Personally, I like the change to this one. It speaks to how chosen bonds are more significant than obligatory ones, and I vibe with that. Not because I don't love my family, but 
even within my family, a relationship of obligation, I'm closer to some than I am to others. And I would act faster for some than I would others. And that's my choice. And this further made me wonder if I could change around the Roses poem to have it say something different. How I could augment this lyric and make my own mark on its language. I mean, I tried it for a bit, <laughs> but it was more difficult than I expected. I kept being met with failure. It's a good thing I have no aspirations to be a poet or a songwriter. But as I was playing with it, I realized that the poem is really about sight more than anything else. Though both flowers can be experienced with all five senses, yes, they can even be heard at times, the poem only focuses on one sense. And yes, I am aware that this is a simplistic poem for children, but sometimes I like to think about simple things until they're complicated. And for this simple thing, I wonder if there is any connection between the simplistic way the flowers are viewed and the one-dimensional way the you is stated to be simply sweet. How do you experience the sweetness of someone else? What makes someone sweet? What does it mean to be a sweet person? To be kind? Pleasant? Gentle? Am I sweet? I asked my coworker and she says, no, but you're funny. As though that is a consolation prize. My husband says, yes, I am, but cannot give me an answer when I ask how I am sweet. This, of course, began another thought spiral again at 11 p.m., but this time on September 9th, a whole year later. If this poem is about love, then it makes sense that the author is speaking firmly in semi-truths. There's nothing we want more in our relationships as humans than certainty. And in thinking this, I find it easier to connect with the original poem. Yes, the end's still icky to me personally, but I can get behind the heart of it. I think if I were truly to rewrite this, keeping its firmness, I would add correlation of some kind. Like, the sky reflects the ocean blue, the rose speaks of love and true. I was me before I knew you, but I like this life when it's us too. I chose your love and you chose mine. Promise me now to do the same each time. Because apart we'd each be fine, but I would rather you agree to be mine. Again, not a poet. But something in this arrangement feels better to me. Like if the original rhyme were the fairy tale, this new atrocity I have created, is what takes place in the happily ever after. It is still simple and doesn't really tell a story, but feels like it has just a little more depth to me and my uncultured, unpoetic brain. For me, though, love is something that doesn't look the same for every person. And while there is for sure a wrong way to love, there is no right way. And love can be more than romantic, but true love is everlasting. My favorite thing about love is that it's a choice to be made daily. Love is work, and the wages of it are human connection, trust, and partnership. I love my husband. And I love my best friends, and I love my sisters, and I love my parents. Each of these loves look different, and sometimes, because they can each be irritating in their own way, I don't always like them, and they can for sure attest to feeling the same about me from time to time. But choosing to love each other through that irritation makes the relationship even more precious. I guess what I'm really getting at with my circular thinking on this strange video is that context is everything. A rose is red, and yellow, and pink, and purple, and sometimes even black. Why is the red rose the one you speak of? Rose is also a name, a brand, a metaphor, a scent. Why are you talking about a flower? Words have meanings, sentences have power, literature has legs, and simple things can be truly complicated. Context means everything. Have a day, kid. <laughs>